ways you can evaluate for yourself as if you have not already done so, you will be able to see later on this presentation. In the meantime, in the meantime, uh, Dennis, can we show that video? It's about a minute and 19 seconds long that I sent you the link for. I can send it again if you lost it. Okay, let me see if I... Okay. Welcome to one of our quantum computing labs. Right over here is one of our dilution refrigeration systems which actually cool down our superconducting qubit devices. There are a number of different plates inside here uh, which all sit at different temperatures. And that gets down all the way to 15 millikelvin. Now that's colder than outer space itself. The sound you hear is actually a pulse tube compressor which essentially is pumping on a closed cycle of helium-4 helium which helps us get the system cold. We have a lot of other equipment that we use in order to run the processors. So there's a lot of uh, microwave ha hardware, different passive components, including filters and attenuators, uh, as well as coax cables, which allow us to send the signals down to address the qubits and to read them out, giving us the controllability. This is a four qubit package. Uh, we have a five qubit device that's right now inside of the fridge, but uh, the general idea for how we actually package up these devices and cool them down is the same. And uh, this is a printed circuit board uh, to which we mount our, our, our qubit chips. Um, and we wire bond to them to connect to, the, to essentially these uh, coaxial pins. And these coaxial pins connect to cables which are inside of the fridge to allow us to send the signals down and to take signals back and read them out. There we go. There you have it. That's their toy. And um, there was... Sound like a Tyrannosaurus. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, yeah, right. So, um, continuing, this is this is uh, this is their the the thing they came up with first, and they've they've gone beyond this. This is uh, from April twenty fifteen. But this is their four qubit device. A couple years ago, maybe I've said it two years in a row or three years in a row, but to me, one of the most striking things is that what's it? Wordsworth was right. Truth is beauty, beauty, truth. You look at the most profound. Um, scientific inventions and they exhibit a marvelous simplicity in their own way look at you know look at this chip isn't this something it's just you know it's like that uh, quantum amplifier that was the spiral that i showed you a few years ago again you know a, a very very profound device that reaches down to levels of our world that are beyond our human perception and yet it was a, a simple coil just a, a simple bimetal coil trimetal coil you might say cooled down to superconducting temperatures and this is something of the same sort this is very much like what we have discussed uh before when we, when we discussed john martinez and the martinez group uh from uh, ucsd uh, that and that group was sort of you know bought by Google for Google quantum computing, and this is essentially the same kind of design. These are Josephson junctions. Uh, what IBM did was leverage leveraged off that work and was able to fab very high reliability devices 
um, that correct for errors very, very well. Um, and this is this is that device. They now have a five qubit device. I guess maybe you know it's almost like a parity bit or something like that. But uh, you can really get lost in this stuff. And th this is the, this is their beautiful little device that um, allows them to um, measure both. You know the. Uh, both kinds of quantum errors, the phase that, you know, this, every, every qubit is described by a complex number. And so they can correct the, uh, you know, the value and the phase of the uh, complex number, the errors correctly. And uh, if these articles are of interest in the, uh, I do have um, all the, um, links and I am going, you know, I will share them. These are links to everything I'm going to show you in my browser today. I do have links for all this, so don't frantically be scribbling down links because I can share them with you in an HTML document, which I can mail to whoever's in, you know, the keeper of the faith here. Okay. So um, we visited Jerry Chow here and let's see here. Um, this is the IBM Quantum Experience. This is a website that you log into and you read the user's guide and then you go into the composer and you compose little programs for the quantum computer. And then you can run them or you can simulate them. You can either run them on the real quantum computer they're scheduled for running it usually ha it happens within a few seconds there's not like you know hundreds and thousands of people on this every hour of the day so uh, the user's guide is a um, fabulous introduction to the mathematics of quantum computing let's see if we got the user's guide up there what, what what is showing on the screen shot right now? Oh, there it is. It's there. It's catching up. Okay. The weird and wonderful world of the qubit. Okay. And and these these numbers down at the bottom are the pages of each presentation. And there's several presentations, and they um, do um, completely. Um, take you through the basics of quantum computing. The math is very hard. <laughs> the math is very hard. Sometimes I'm baffled, but I'm still baffled to some extent by Venn diagrams. So I was able to get through many, many years of programming without really entirely understanding the math of it. And so I hope that the quantum computing era, I will not be disappointed anymore. Anyway, they have a visual composer. Um, and it looks like this. And you can save off the, you know, for the, it, it's got the five qubits here, uh, Q0 through Q4, and then you can save your experiments. And these are the scores. This is what they look like after you've composed them. For instance, Basically, these are ones where I've been following through in the user's guide um, from um, and, and carrying out, you know, going to the composer and creating these uh, as, as described. And then you can uh, look at your execution results. Okay, and this uh, the C which is you know permit me to digress a second. Now we're gonna we're gonna 
you can see the experiment. The input is zero zero, and the output is zero zero with a reliability of 0.933. You know, 0.023 of the of the hundred shots or a thousand shots that it did. When you when when you do one of these exercises, when you do one of these quantum gate things where it steps through a couple operations of the gates, it um, it does about a thousand executions of your program you can you can ask for different numbers of executions and then you get the statistical result of the experiment um, because i can't um i'm in the middle of this i can i can move it okay, okay well. yes, then. and i said no but you think we need we need or not yeah huh so okay. i'm here can you sorry can i oh. Sorry about that. I'll mute myself. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is quantum indeterminacy in the in the in the fig presentation. Here is what it is. Okay. So, uh, backing up, all of you have all of you have been here. Uh, you know, for previous things, you may recall that we had said in previous years that the. Um, quantum computing we were looking at with D-Wave tended to be sort of like early um, analog computing. It was, you know, kind of hardwired algorithms that ran downhill one way and uh, that the um, El Dorado of quantum computing was gates, you know, ha operations, basically operations from uh, that were hypothesized, have been hypothesized over the past two decades. And each of these gates would be like a gate or an operation operator in uh, standard, you know, uh, uh, binary digital computing, except that these would be Q operations. And one of the fundamental, uh, CNOT is kind of like, um, a, it, it, it's kind of the universal operator like NAND is in Boolean logic. CNOT is the quantum uh, universal operator controlled not is 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 what it stands for and if you ask me to go much deeper than that in explaining why I can sit here and suck my thumb for a few minutes and then I can sort of figure out sort of an answer but I don't want to present myself as any kind of expert on that but that's that is the basic this is one of the gates and what they're getting to here is they're getting to gate style quantum computing it's happening it's definitely happening and this is an experiment of a CNOT gate being run it, it's very you know it's a very simple it's, it's very it's a, it's a CNOT the the experiment itself that I was showing oops let's see I lost my the experiment which I composed in the composer following the instructions from the user guide is the instance of a CNOT gate being stimulated with the input zero zero okay you know wow you know big deal but it is a big deal because it works and here is how it works it works with this reliability what you expect from an input of zero zero with a c naught gate is you expect the output zero zero that is what you expect and when they run this for real on their real hardware it returns it with a 0.933 probability which gives you an idea of where we are with this stuff but the speed at which they are working through this and improving their error correction and improving their results and, and it is expected in quantum computing that there may be a conventional computing stage of you know defuzzifying the results because of the nature of quantum computing the quantum computers may not be immediately usable purely uh, you know, first of all, they're not going to have any user interface. They're going to be a card that goes into things. Um, but their outputs may have to be further error corrected. But IBM is doing everything they can at the moment. This is, you know, this is how good it gets with the hardware they have they have reached now. Um, oops, I did it again. Hold on, second. let's see, go forward. Um, th this is... 
a poly gate, um, a superposi superposition circuit, uh, a random classical circuit, complete superposition. I've got a lot of these, and these are all—all all of these are experiments that are in the user's guide, so you can read their explanations, which are more coherent than anything I'd come up with. But basically, these are qubit inputs stepping through gate operations. And it's online, and if you sign up for IBM Quantum Computing Experience, you can play with this too. Wow. Uh, what's not there? A lot of things that weren't there last time we talked. You know, quantum memory. Quantum RAM, that is an elder, you know, the next El Dorado is like it, because as we have discussed before, quantum algorithms require that every step of the algorithm be um, that every step of the algorithm be in the quantum universe as it were i mean that's not that I don't, universe isn't really a, a good word for it because it's our universe it's not a separate universe in any way shape or form but that things are not that the wave function as they say does not collapse upon uh observation so you cannot take an in a, a complex quantum algorithm you cannot take intermediate results and store them in conventional memory and then input them to the next stage of a quantum algorithm as you restart the as you continue the algorithm the algorithm has to run through from beginning to end um as a as a as as an in an entangled state and the entangled state is disrupted by observation so um it would be nice to have quantum ram so you could store intermediate results from a from five qubits and then do another result and store that in quantum RAM and then superimpose the results of the two previous calculations all without ending entanglement. But there is no such thing yet. Or maybe there is. There are certain, um, certainly ways that have been demonstrated to do this. One is with electron gases because electron gases, you, you shoot a couple, elect, you shoot a couple, fo a pair of entangled photons into electron gas. The, the pair of photons are entangled. They bang into an electron. They are absorbed. And then a moment later, they are re-emitted and they're still in the entangled state. So basically, you've got the kind of DRAM refresh loop, except it's in, in the quantum world. Making this a, you know, practical engineering is another question. Nobody, as far as I know, has come up with a way, but that doesn't mean they haven't. It just means I don't know about it. It's, it certainly hasn't been announced that there is a definite way. Another way that might be quantum RAM is that there are crystals that if you put a charge on them, um, they are translucent to entangled laser light. And then um, if you change the charge on them, they suddenly become opaque. But if there were entangled photons moving through them at the time, they... Um, the photons get trapped when it becomes non-translucent, and then when you change the current back, they are re-emitted, still entangled. So this sounds like another possibility for for D, for for quantum DRAM, and there are others. But as I said, as far as I know, no one has announced such a thing. So when you have, you know, we now have quantum processors that can execute basic gate operations. They have a very small number of qubits. And it's hard to increase the number of qubits, but IBM went from four to five. And if you can go from four to five, you can go from five to a thousand, you know, sooner or later. And so the general hope that we had that we've expressed in the previous presentations in previous years that this was going to come down to simply a matter of engineering is basically being fulfilled. It is coming down to a matter of engineering and one of the world's, you know, top research and development organizations in the world today in private industry, IBM is on the job and they are, um, they are, they are moving the engineering along. Uh, let's see here. 
Uh, I wonder if I have enough. I wonder if I have enough uh, credits left. You, you, you have to earn credits on IBM's. Uh, um, On, on 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 the quantum experience to uh, let's see is this one I think we have the right one here you have to you have to earn credits to uh, use the real processor let's say I'm gonna try to edit this one is it coming up and that's do I have the right screen up let's see Yeah, there it is. I'm going to try to run this one. I don't know if I have enough units. I think I have six left. Okay, it tells me that for 1,024 shots of my algorithm, I've got, I need three units. I think I have five or six left. So I'm going to do 1,024 since there's no difference between one and 1,024. So it's actually running this. Uh, we found the result of the same code executed recently on the device. Would you like to get the result otherwise? So should I, so tell me, should I run it really? Do you want to see it really run on the quantum computer or should I just get the results from the cache of results from previous runs? Well, they might have different results, they, you know, because, it, again, this is not perfect. You know, so let's look at the results from the cache first. Okay, that, maybe we can go back. That's an interesting experiment. There we go. There's an experiment. Results from cache. Okay. Cache results found. Yeah, that's from 506. That's from, you know, several months ago. Okay. So the results were 0, 0 0.065 versus, so the re expected result is a 1, you know. So this shows you where they were at in terms of uh, the raw execution of the processor. Uh, a, a funny aside, everybody knows IBM Watson, right? IBM Watson is their artificial intelligence system. I remember that when I first got involved with the fourth interest group in 1986 or 87, um, AI was very big, and there was some hope that Forth would be a big player in AI and neural networks and all that stuff. And uh, and here it is, you know, 2016, 30 years later, and IBM has this huge supercomputer that, you know, can hold conversations for you almost past the uh, Turing test and, uh, and plays on Jeopardy and does business analytics. They're trying to sell it as business analytics. And as far as I've heard, this is not like a fabulously successful venture. Uh, people can't figure out how to use it. It's too raw. And an example is I signed up for IBM Watson. And um, it said, you know, put in a CSV. You know, put in a CSV of some data and we'll analyze it for you. And so I put in this. You could dump these quantum experiments as CSV files. And uh, let's see, where the heck is it? Download, yeah, download all data. You know, so you could download this data as uh, a CSV file. There's a download data button at the bottom of the screen. I don't know if it's on your screen right now, but uh, yeah. So um, you could download the data. It comes down to CSV file. So I downloaded one of these CSV files, and Watson told me the value one is trending. <laughs> so. <laughs> So that was Watson's helpful advice for me. The value one in my quantum experiments was trending. So, um, so okay, so we got 935 to 0.065. Now, yeah, there's download CSV right here. Yeah. So uh, now I'd like, now, now maybe we should run it on the real uh, processor and see if we get the exact same results. New execution. Go. Here we go. Yeah, there's one execution before yours, so I'm apparently I'm I, I'm scheduled in a uh, 
scheduled in a queue, and we will find out what happens when my experiment runs. One of the ways is uh, you work your way through the user guide. They they watch you work your way. You know, the, the system watches you work your way through the user guide. And if you're really playing, and sometimes I think you can earn uh, points by participating in the forums. Okay, while we're waiting, let's go see that. Um, uh, there is a com IBM community here, and that you can look at. Um, the um, you could discuss things uh, with other people who are experimenting with this, and I think you get points for participation in the community, and you also can get uh, uh, credits for uh, you know demonstrating that you have some interest that IBM considers uh, you know significant. And I have put in for one saying I've written about quantum computing and that I talk about it, uh, you know, with the fourth interest group and stuff like that. So uh, I've put in for more. This in the last few months has not been my top priority. I've not spent a tremendous amount of time um, on it, on, on, on the IBM quantum experience. I've checked in from time to time, um, but I have not. After my first run, as you can see, uh, let's see. All right, I'm gonna go back here because we have the other screen. So um, let's see if we got results yet here. Ah, we got a slightly different result this time, right? Or is that he yeah, executed on December seventeenth at twelve oh one p.m. And we have a slightly different result than we did the last time. Oh, wait, this is the one from the cache. Let's see. Down, let's see. Yeah, download all data. Let's see what this is here. So um, I have not. Uh, you, you saw that I had, you know, I've done about 25 of the experiments and stuff like that. I did them earlier this year around May, and then I kind of, you know, got busy, not with modern computing, but with old computing. I've been working more and more with uh, IBM mainframes and IBM midranges, which are in crisis state as people our age retire from maintaining them. And... Uh, require a lot of experienced hands to keep people's basic business processes running, which has not turned out to be the easiest easiest thing. Huh? Let's see, where's Okay. That's just for that one experiment. Let's see. Go back and the experiment and see if the results I don't know how you know when, if it's scheduled, uh, you get your results. Let's see, executed. So, is this the current? Is this the result we got today, or is this the result from the cache? And I keep clicking download all data, and I don't get anything. Nothing comes up. Oh well. Anyway. Um, other interesting articles that we have found, uh, Kevin found these. Now we get towards solving, we're, we're moving towards solving the mystery I was going to show you about why the, uh, the chess championship in London and why that, that fellow with the powdered wig and what the connection is. Um, Quantum computer memory cell. These people are complaining. I'm complaining. They're, they are claiming a quantum computer memory cell of higher dimension than a qubit. Okay. And that's the Russian Academy of Sciences. Okay. 
And they mentioned that in a matter of hours, you know, this paves the way towards high-level quantum structures, said Leonid Fedichkin, expert, we'd say in Yiddish, Wurzager, uh, a spokesperson for the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, and this is the meat of it right here. So uh, the article, again, there are links to all these in this, so I, I will not, um, I'm, I'm getting, to a, getting to a point here. Here's another um, interesting article. Um, and this one is basically about the other, the other story. The, it's, it's basically the same story as the other one, just at a different, different time. Here's more chess. Okay, here is mate in 549 moves. Does everybody know what we're looking at here? What this, what a table base is? Does, does, has, has anyone here heard of table bases? I can see it. Raise your hand if you've heard of table bases before. Chess table bases. Nobody has. Oh, wait. Ke Kevin has heard of chess table bases. Basically, since the original experiments with queen endings by... Um, uh, the fellow who invented C, who was also interested in chess. Oh, good God. Just uh, now all that comes to my name is Kemeny, who invented BASIC. What's the name of the guy who invented the C language? Dennis, uh, Dennis, um, Dennis Ritchie. Ritchie was interested. In, he was interested. He was a chess player. He, 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 he was very interested and he, um, did the first experiments with solving uh, queen endings. Um, these are the latest in series of developments where the chess world has used networks of supercomputers over a period of years to definitively solve certain categories of endings by looking at every single possibility because in the current understanding of game theory chess is what you call an intrinsically difficult problem which means that its solution is only found in exhaustive calculation to all possible terminal positions and so the best that we have been able to do up to now has been to set supercomputers to calculating these endings when there's less material on the board and therefore there is less complexity. You know, it goes down from complexity beyond the number of atoms in the galaxy to somewhat less than that. So the supercomputers have been very successful. Uh, what was released publicly up to now was the six piece table bases. This gets back to quantum computing, I promise you. I'm taking you on a long detour, but we're going to get back to it. Um, six uh, uh, publicly available and, ha and have been publicly available for some time have been the six-piece table bases. That means there's six pieces on the board counting both kings. What L Lomonosov is, is, the, um, is, the, is the Soviet facility for supercomputing. That is now the Russian facility for supercomputing, and um, and that is who we were looking at a picture of before. Mikhail Lomonosov lived for fifty-seven years or so, or fifty-four years, in the eighteenth century, and he discovered that Venus had an atmosphere, and he discovered uh, uh, the melting temperature of Mercury and a lot of other interesting things. So he was the first. Uh, Russian scientist who was um, uh, acclaimed in Europe, broadly acclaimed in Europe, and he actually contributed largely to the grammar of the Russian language, which was just emerging at that time because all the educated Russians spoke German and French, and they did not speak their native language, which was a, a jargon to, as far as they were concerned, and it didn't become a formal language until the 18th. 18th century, and he was one of the grammarians who allowed it to become a uh, a, a, a a literary language. So um, the Lomonosov uh, facility 
dedicated supercomputing time to this, and they frequently do. Their chess masters have access for opening analysis to the supercomputers. The government still sponsors chess to that extent that they provide them with supercomputer time to do opening analysis, and it shows in their results. Um, but the um, but this is one of the solutions, and this is one of the most striking solutions that they found in doing the seven-man table bases, which is that this is a white mates in 549 moves. And it starts like this. You know, here we go, move by move, and you can walk through it, and these are online, and you got to sign up to, to, to do anything beyond just play with some of the mates in 549, and I have not done so. I have not signed up for this Russian website. I kind of just stay away from them to some extent. But um, here is an article um, by Jovan Petronich, who was involved with this um, project to some extent. And I believe, I believe Petronich is uh, actually uh, Serbian. And he was working with, he's a, he's a chess trainer who was working with the Lomonosov facility in, you know, evaluating and setting up to publicize these results. Um, here's Petronich at the chessboard here in this little picture. And he says something interesting. He says something interesting. Um, he says, in passing, he says that several Arab sheiks are ready to sponsor a project that aims at building the complete chess tables by 2263. That's a pretty ambitious project. They're talking about 250 years in the future because they're guessing that with the speed up of computers, they can solve the whole game by computation by 2263 uh, due to Moore's law and the dates of the three, four, five, six, seven man end game solutions that have evolved, you know, over the years as they have gotten past three men, four men, six men solutions and published these. Okay. Right now it's like petabyte databases for them. They're, they're, they're in, that's what the table bases are. They're databases of these solutions and they're definitive and complete. So in 250 years, he says, the whole game of chess will be considered. And then he, he goes on, he, he, he bloviates a bit about Moore's law. And then he says, of course, Traditional computers cannot handle so large a task. The algorithm, currently the algorithm is adapted to a quantum computer, which from what follows, he does not understand very well, but it says quantum computers are more powerful. The results are mainly approximate. A quantum computer can easily solve an eight man chess ending. So we took a nine man ending as the first target, which we believe should provide us with a new longest mate record. It's a pity that quantum storage is still too expensive and we have to store the data using HDDs. Well, that's, I think that's fatuous. I think he doesn't mean quite what he's saying because they certainly, you know, you know, the, the, the difference between the number of quantum bits we can muster and the storage on a hard disk drive is, you know, ridiculously, you know, to, you know, hundreds of orders of magnitude different. So, I don't think he means quantum storage. I think he means that they don't have quantum computers with enough qubits to do very much, and et cetera, et cetera. And we have no powerful enough quantum computer at our site, so we emulate it using 65 536 cores of the L Lomonosov supercomputer. Okay. So they are trying to adapt quantum algorithms in simulation to solving the real, the almost real world problem of chess endings. Okay, now hold that thought. In 1997, I had a conversation with Ava Bazoki. And Ava Bazoki, and I published a Dr. Dobbs, and this woman had been part of, she was a Hungarian, and she had been part of the um, Hungarian communist and Soviet, you know, like, like, like Europe has CERN for nuclear experiments, the Centre European pour Recherche Nucléaire. And um, this, the Eastern Bloc at that time had a facility at a place called Demona. And um, 
she had worked on that. And then she, you know, in 1990 or so, she came to the West and she became an expert in computer security. And so I was interviewing her about um, uh, computer security. But we, of course, you know, it was, it was fascinating to go back and see how she had worked on very, very complex numerical calculations at a time when the computers in the Eastern Bloc were not really very terribly sophisticated and were not they what sophisticated stuff they had was not widely distributed and um what she said um let's see she said in the you were asking about science in Hungary. In those times, you, you needed to buy equipment you could buy off the shelf, and that became a problem as if you needed equipment off the shelf that was available in the Western countries because it wasn't available in the Eastern countries. Um, so they, oh, I said Demona, but it's Dubna uh, that was, was the place it was. Um, the Russian physicists are very good. Their theoretical training is very good. The problem is when experiments cost money and need access to Western equipment. Um, so, let's see. So, the, the training was very good. And when you can't afford, she says, the training was very good. And when you can't afford expensive equipment, you take measurements made by others and evaluate those measurements from different points of view. Our physicists were very imaginative and inventive. We could always come up with questions and calculations that did not require big computers or big equipment. So I've noticed this before, you know, as, as an American engineer, I've been through this where they say, well, can you work on this, uh, you know, in simulation or something like that? And I and other engineers tend to shrug our shoulders and say, hey, let's wait till we get the real equipment. It'll be here in a week. And let, why waste any time? You know, it's, it's on its way. It's, you know, UPS has it. And so let's not fiddle around. I'll do something, you know. So we're very um, offhand about access to equipment. And uh, we don't spend a lot of time doing thought experiments when we do engineering. But in other countries where the equipment is not so readily available, and, but the training and the academic training is very good. They can do, they, they, they have a culture. It, it seems to me, both from this article and this conversation with Bazoki and various, you know, uh, observations I've made over the decades, they have a culture of working very, very hard uh, on paper, you know, or whatever the equivalent of paper is for them at the moment you know, working hard in, in mathematical mo and modeling um, scientific experiments that they don't have access to the equipment to perform and being prepared for the time when they do have these things. So I've, I've taken you a long roundabout way through chess, but maybe you see my point, which is that I don't know how, I, I have no way of assessing whatsoever what the relative, um, quality of quantum computing hardware is in Russia, but I would think, I would think it, um, you know, with a, with a quantum certainty of 99.35%, I would think it very close to certain that at such time as this equipment becomes available to them, they may well be at our level or beyond in terms of understanding how this can be applied because they are thinking about it. It's obvious that they're thinking about it very, very hard and they have very bright and very well-trained people that, um, that are in a culture of doing thought experiments even when you don't have the hardware in front of you. So, and, uh, and, and and so and so as not to totally make this a um, you know a total IBM pro, you know production. Google is still moving ahead, and uh, they they have you know, again a you know a Russian emigre who is working very hard on and making presentations. Um, and again, the the topic of the year 
understanding the effects of disorder, quantum interference, and interactions between electrons on the properties of bulk, low dimensional, and mesoscopic conductors. Okay, again, this is, you know, the theoretical physicists taking it down to engineering on how we make quantum computers that will deliver results without error. And, you know, we, we were, when we started, what was it, five years ago, we started having these annual, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd pop in on Google, uh, maybe it was five or six years ago, we've been doing this. Um, and we were talking about 50 years then, and it looks more, looks a lot more like 15 years now than it looks like, than it looked like, you know, it looked like 55 years ago, but it looks like 15 years now. And heaven knows how fast they will move ahead um, you know, as, as, as there becomes a race to achieve this. I mean, it's clear to me that IBM sees a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow, and they certainly would like to come up with, um, they certainly would like to come up with uh, the answer to this, and then it would be the golden age again for IBM, and they would be the richest computer company in the world once again if they manage to build this thing. And so, uh, I, and I think that the, if one of them comes up with a saleable device, that they're correct in their assumption because uh, the applications are breathtaking. Um, think about how we make decisions in the modern world. Uh, the, the results of quantum computers, even with error correction, tend to be statistical. You know, the, al the quantum algorithms tend to have statistical, they, they, they tend to have a statistical nature to them. They deliver, uh, they don't deliver concrete answers. They deliver um, hints to where the answer lies, which, you know, the classic um, busting encryption algorithm involves the fact that uh, encryption is made difficult to crack by the fact that find when you're up in the very large numbers, finding the next prime number is difficult. There is a conventional algorithm which says if you have four good guesses as to where it lies, you can find it very quickly by conventional computing. And there's an algorithm in quantum computing for taking f that produces four good guesses as to where the next prime number lies. Ergo, quantum computers can break conventional DES encryption. You know, that's, that was, the, that was the, the first algorithm that they really got interested in. So there's lots of things, you know, the stock market, climate, uh, you know. There's so many things that these things can be used for, um, you know, elections, <laughs> you know, stuff like that, uh, financial planning, anything. Um, this will become must-have tools for both government and industry if they emerge because you will lose your competitive edge if you don't have access to them. Uh, if Thomas J. Watson Jr. famously said in the early 1950s, they built a computer and they wanted to put, you know, bet, uh, bet the bank on computing. IBM was a business machine manufacturer. They manufactured uh, you know, punch card machines. They manufactured meat scales at the time and stuff like that. They stopped doing that actually in the 50s, late 40s. But they had been all kinds of business equipment and everybody said, let's bet the store on computing. And, and, and Thomas J. Watson Jr. totally brushed it off. He said, you know, they're never going to need more than four of these in the whole world, he said. And, and of course, that was his concept of, com of digital binary computing. They were never going to need mo more than four of them in the whole world. You know, so it's obvious, you know, from human experience that if you know, indust if the industrial age continues and we c continue to have the ability, we don't you know drown ourselves or wipe ourselves out as a species. Uh, that quantum computing will um, will arrive and will become um, de rigueur. Uh, for managing the large number of problems that we solve by statistics, by statistics, and uh, you know, and will lead to new insights in science. And as these become accessible to young people, uh, they will find new uses for them. And uh, so, I think you know, any company like you know, IBM has the largest 
you know, engineering, computer engineering research team there is in the world, as far as I know. And I'm pretty sure that uh, applying that to it, you know, wherever the theoretical research comes from, whatever, whatever, I'll, I'll bet, you know, I, I, I'd be willing to bet a substantial sum that IBM is going to be the first to, to deliver a, a, a product line based on quantum computing that actually sells and is actually useful in, in, in industry and in government. Well, it depends on what you know. What you what you expect from AI? Uh, I mean, there are things that are called AI and things that are called machine control, and they're you know, AI is a is a just a term we throw around, and some people arbitrarily say, well, this is AI, and that is not AI. I remember talking uh, with Lotvi Zade for publication, uh, who I believe is still alive, uh, Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at uh, UCB, and. Um, he was the inventor of fuzzy set theory, which became fuzzy logic. And, and all our phones work on what he did. And the trains in Japan run on what he did, run on the mathematics that he came up with. You know, is that AI? It's very effective AI. Our phones work. They find the face in the image. Um, they, uh, the trains run on time. I remember uh, 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 William Kahn, who invented the mathematics for the IBM 8087, which became the RFC for math, he, he burst into the interview I was doing with Latvia Zaddy down in uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, he, he, and demanded to be heard. And so it turned into a two-issue interview. And uh, he thought uh, 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 Latvia Zaddy's math, who, and Latvi, they have offices next to each other at UCB, or did when before both of them retired. Um, he felt that uh, fuzzy logic was uh, mathematical sin. That it was not valid. That it that you had to do you know typical PID control loops and get really really accurate answers with classical formulae. And Luffy said he shrugged and he said the trains in Japan if it didn't work they'd be killing people on a daily basis you know but they don't they 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 use this math and they uh, they work so what's AI you know there's a lot of successful AI in the world you know finding finding a finding a computer that like uh, uh, you know like deep thought in the science fiction book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, will tell you the answer to life, the universe, and everything is not on the horizon. Uh, but but, but, but the, if, if, the, if, if, if you define AI as the ability of the, of the computer to, um, to increasingly come up with answers to questions humans have that, 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 that humans usually make decisions, uh, well, to get back to chess, Richard Retty, uh, a great chess master who died, unfortunately, of scarlet fever in the 1920s at the age of 40, uh, wrote one of the best short chess books ever written called Modern Ideas in Chess. And in it, he mentioned, he said, he opined that chess, um, let's see here, I think I have it here. Hold on a second. Here we go. See if you can see this. My daughter made this for me. Let's see. Richard Retty said that um, in the idea of chess and the development of the chess mind, we have a picture of the intellectual struggle of mankind. And what he meant by that was that uh, chess is too deep 
for us to understand, you know, to totally comprehend all the evidence is there, but we can't absorb it all. So we have to, but we are compelled by the clock to make a move. And life is like that. All the evidence is there. We understand in some kind of theoretical way that if we, um, if we had infinite time, we could come up with the correct decision every time. But the existential nature of the human experience is we never have enough time and we do a lot of guesswork. Uh, now we have computers to aid us in this guesswork. They are still guessing. And we see this very much in chess computing. Chess computing, uh, you know, at the end games, they can look it up. When they get down to the six piece end games, they can just look it up in the table base. And then they're absolutely correct because it's been calculated laboriously every single possibility and been put into databases. But before that time, they are guessing like us. In some ways they guess better, in some ways they don't guess better. There's the kinds of positions computers handle well and the kind of chess positions that computers don't handle well. And chess was always taken as being a great model of the AI problem. And it is, remains a good, a good example of the AI problem because chess masters use computers in their chess preparation. They use them extensively and they use them unremittingly. And even so, the answers are not perfect. They just help them expand their, pro you know, like, like computers are prosthetics for the mind. And they, you know, like, like Waldo's and Robert, ha Robert A. Heinlein's science fiction where they, you know, he, you could move little things and they moved something big in the distance and that's how... And they took that invention from Robert A. Heinlein's book, Waldo, and they used it to pick up isotopes behind lead glass. And, you know, they'd move the hands on this side and they would move the hands on the other side of the wall and stuff. And so computers are like that for us. They're things that expand our range, but they don't actually, you know, artificial intelligence is still intelligence and intelligence is flawed and imperfect. So any, go ahead. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Wonderful to see you again. And Happy New Year. Take care. Thank you, gentlemen.